Anne Thwaite, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, be part of my In Conversation series, which is part of the In Conversation series for the Secret Garden Venture, um, for the Secret Garden Experience. It's really lovely to see you. Well, it's good to be here in, uh, at home, but seeing, talking to you. Exactly, virtually, virtually. It's a strange world, isn't it? Strange. Mm. Strange. It is strange. Um, but I thought how lovely it was when um, we came um, together here to see all those books behind you, because uh, you've been a, a, a prolific writer. Um, and for these purposes, not least because you are the official biographer of Francis Hodgson Burnett. Yes, don't use the word official. Official. I I, I, I'm, I was authorised in the sense that Christopher Robin and Christopher Milne, uh, no, sorry, I'm talking about Francis Hodgson Burnett. Do you see there? That's a stupid thing to say. I, uh, I, I've never, isn't that interesting? No, I was totally not an official biographer with Francis Hodgson Burnett. I was thinking of the Milne one. Um, I got a contract before um, I spoke to the family because I knew that they didn't want an, a, a biography. Their, their father had written one that was never published in England. And uh, it was such a scandalous life that they didn't want people to know about it. And in fact, oh. the family didn't go on talking about it for ages. And so I made sure that I had a contract and was had to do it before I met the family. Then I managed to win them over and they began to trust me and they began to send me letters and so on. But it's certainly not an official biography. Oh, that's really interesting. And so um, you got a contract over here and then won them over. When was it? And not only over here, but a, a joint uh, contract between a publisher, a publisher in London and a publisher in New York. Right. Uh, her own publishers, Scriveners, yeah, publishers in New York. And when and when was this? This well, I started thinking about it in 1969, oh. long, long time ago, <laughs> and uh, I was a, a young woman with uh, four children and very much involved in the children's book world, and uh, I was getting tired of being um, rather sidelined as a children's writer, mm -hmm. though I actually believe it's much more important what children read than what adults read. But anyway, I thought I'd like to write a book that adults would read and people would start taking me seriously. And so after my um, Camelthorn Papers was published by Macmillan in 69, I uh, looked around for a subject for an adult book. I didn't want to write a novel because I didn't th think I'd write the sort of novel that I'd want to read. Um, <laughs> but I did want to write a biography. And I, I mean, I was a great reader of biographies and I'd read a very good one of E. Nesbitt and a good one of J.M. Barry. And I thought, and I don't know anything about Francis Hodgson Burnett and The Secret Garden is a book I've loved all my life. I read it as a child. And I remember the first film um, that I saw in 1949 um, when I was 15 or so. And I thought, I wonder what Francis Hodgson Burnett was like. I knew nothing about her. Anyway, that was the beginning. Oh, that's fascinating. And your biography, which was re-released last year, was it republished yes. last year? Yes, um, yes. Is, is called Beyond the Secret Garden, which yes. I thought is a lovely title. Yes, well, the original title was, was uh, Waiting for the Party, because that oh. was something she did all her life. She always felt the party was going on in other rooms. Mm. And was always slightly missing out, and which was really strange. But it came the theme came up ever again. But anyway, people didn't like that title because it didn't relate to the secret garden. And the secret garden is the thing that most people are interested about her. But in fact, she was more famous in her lifetime for Little Lord Fauntleroy. Yes, yes, a and huge the, bestseller. And um, that. That hasn't kept up with the Secret Garden, which is interesting, isn't it? Because you were saying earlier that for her, was it her Times obituary, um, the Secret Garden wasn't mentioned. Oh, that's right. And when she died in 1924, the Secret Garden wasn't mentioned in the Times, no. And uh, everyone was interested in the little, in little Lord Fauntleroy. And a little princess was also, of course, quite... Um, and Little Princess, I think, has gone on to a certain extent. There's certainly been a number of films, very yeah. good with um, Alex Guinness um, as the Lord, as the Dorincourt. 
But um, no, um, it, it, it's very interesting that the Secret Garden has always been read, but it, more and more has it become a, a, a standard classic children's book, any list of children's books, and it's always right there near the top, along with yes. Winnie the Pooh, I might say. Yeah. Yes, and, and it's, it's interesting going back to what you were saying about um, feeling that you were sidelined because of as a children's writer children's books and that as a children's writer yes um, and I am absolutely with you 100% on this idea that um, writing and for me performing creating shows um, that the best books the best stories the best theatre um, it's just a matter of of uh, demographic it's just a matter of age group rather than one being better than the other wasn't it um, C.S. Lewis said um, uh, a book for children that doesn't um, what is it something like um, uh, a book that's only written for children isn't a good book at all you know? yes I think Philip Pullman has said that too you know uh, that any good children's book is likely to be one that adults would enjoy yes uh, Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's right. But, uh, as I said, I do think actually what children read is more important and the, and the, the books that they read in, as children need to be good books, yeah. need to be the sort of books that would appeal to adults. Absolutely. Not, not, not rubbish. <laughs> and, and a good story is a good story, isn't it? Yeah, and um, I, I think you're so right. And there, I read The Secret Garden as a, as a child um, and I was born and grew up in Yorkshire. And so for me, um, hearing my dialect, you know, when my when my dad read it to me, uh, it was just so exciting because actually a lot of books didn't didn't have dialect, did they? No. Not, no. You know. But the interesting thing about that is that um, she hardly knew Yorkshire at all. Mm -hmm. She only visited once. Um, she was bought, born, born in Manchester and it was the Lancashire dialect that fascinated her and she really loved it and her first, it's very interesting, her first adult books had an enormous amount of Lancashire dialect in them, that Las Olaris. I did an um, introduction to an edition of that not very long ago. It's a very good story. But it, people do find dialect difficult to read. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my husband always used to say he'd never read The Secret Garden, although he was a Yorkshireman, um, because of, he couldn't bear the dial reading the dialect. <sighs> it, it couldn't actually... I mean, I think a lot of children find it difficult to read. I think they even find that in William now, you know, with all those missing um, ends of letters, you know, William books. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Not nearly as popular as they used to be, because children are not so good at reading strange words. Yes. <laughs> I like to all Williams. And, and it's interesting because not only have you got the dialect, but obviously um, in The Secret Garden, you've also got, um, well, I would consider really interesting um, sentence construction. Um, which isn't our sort of natural way of, of reading and hearing nowadays. Um, but that's what also draws you in. So when I was doing the adaptation, I was really challenged by how much of it do I keep in that original and how much will I then be um, alienating today's audience? Well, um, yes. It's, it's an interesting dilemma for me. As a writer, you see, when I wrote uh, children's books, I used to always use interesting words, but always put them in a context which made, the under, the, uh, it, made it clear what the word meant. But yeah. I think a lot of children's books today are starved of interesting vocabulary. Yes, yes, I would agree with you. And made too easy to read. Yes. Yeah, and when I um, tell stories in schools or when I'm um, sharing stories, I do the same thing. I use rich language um, and, and, and the children go with it mm. because they can sense it, feel it, see it, uh, and therefore... I mean, most know, children love unusual words. Yes. As long yes. as they know what's yeah. going on. I, I actually just sent one of my very early in readers to what my great-grandson and the word zoom comes in it. The pigeon in the story zooms down the stairs. Yeah. And he, 
uh, Max is already familiar with, he's only two, but he's already familiar with the word Zoom. And his father, my grandson, says it more or less knows the book by heart already. He loves all these odd words. Yes. And of course, um, again, when I go into schools, I see the children, uh, they start to play in the playground afterwards and they begin to use those words. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. But um, I want to come back to um, you starting to get interested in um, Francis Hodgson Burnett in 1969. Yeah. Um, how long did it take you to write Beyond the Secret Garden and to, you know, explore it and, and dig out all the research and what have you? Norm there's an enormous amount of research yeah. involved in any biography. I've written five biographies and they each take about five years. Actually, one of them was even longer. But um, Francis Hodgson Burnett they wasn't published until 74. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it involved a number of visits to America. That's another interesting thing about her, of course. The Americans think she's American. We always think she's English. In fact, we claim her as English completely. She was born in Manchester. And, uh, but she lived, uh, she lived almost half uh, equal amounts of time on either side. She was 15 when the family emigrated to Tennessee. And she crossed the Atlantic 33 times. I counted them. Wow. And this is a time when each voyage, I mean, I often used to say to amuse children, that if she'd, ha if she'd suffered from seasickness, her life <laughs> would have been entirely different. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Because it would take how long? Two weeks? Something like yeah. that? Yes, two weeks. Uh, and I think, yes, roughly. I think they got a bit quicker than that towards the end. Right. Mm. Because she on going right right through her life she crossed the Atlantic and you were saying that the re one of the reasons that you um, were drawn to her is because if you'd just read the secret garden you wouldn't know anything about her tell tell me a little bit you know what what uh well what you discovered she did have a very remarkable life I mean she had experience of extreme poverty when they first her father died her, she was born in Manchester they said and her father died when she was young and the family was quite poor her mother tried to keep the business going which was interesting her father was a um, an ironmonger and um, um, dealt with all things household stuff and she, the, the mother was obviously an enterprising woman but she couldn't manage it in those in those circumstances and she took the whole family there were five children to america because her brother lived in tennessee and he had written welcoming them and asking them to come but when they arrived they she found that it was just the end of the civil war 1865 and th things had changed and it was very difficult time and they were very poor and she wrote her first stories to earn money for the family and uh, in fact, in her, one of her letters to an editor, she wrote, my object is remuneration. Did she? Very yes. Often. That's, and, that's and she was enormously successful right from the beginning. I mean, her stories were always being accepted. And then she went to America, uh, to um, Paris, because her, she took quite a long time to decide to marry. Um, it was about seven years, in fact, from when she first met uh, the man who became her husband. And he was a, um, a doctor and he wanted to train as an eye specialist. And the best course apparently was in Paris. And so they went to Paris with one child already and she supported the family. And this is extraordinarily unusual in those days. Absolutely. <laughs> and supported them by sending stories back to her editor, to the magazines in America. So- Interesting. And, she, and in fact, um, The Secret Garden, sorry, The Secret Garden was first published by the Amer American magazine, wasn't it? It was serialized. Well, her, she went on being published by magazines all her life. Did um, she? But in the beginning, this was before, she wrote her first novel, which was this one I mentioned, that La Solaris, set in Lancashire, while she was in Paris. So she had an advance on that. She wrote two stories a month, was a contract she had to get a regular income to support them in Paris. And she became pregnant with her second child while they were there. So she was a remarkable woman writing a novel oh. she did she had taken with her um a young um a, a native american um, um african-american and um so she had help 
uh, and they had a very good relationship. She was marvelous, this girl, at keeping uh, Lionel, the two-year-old, out of her way while she was getting yes. on her stories, because the whole thing depended on her writing her stories, you see. Yes. But, um, but, and so that, that was a pretty impressive beginning. And she went on being rather impressive in lots of different ways. And oh, so, so she became immensely rich later, largely due to Little Lord Fauntleroy, which was the hugest, the, one of the greatest bestsellers of all time. I mean, it was amazing. Everyone read Little Lord Fauntleroy. And even Gladstone, the English the Prime Minister of England, read it and invited her to lunch on the strength of it. He said it was doing good for the relations between America and England. Wow. So many interesting, strange uh, stories we could if we had all day. I know. Well, I wish we had all day. And I've <laughs> I've um, read Beyond the Secret Garden. I just thought it was so, uh, so interesting and and um, compelling. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's a really um, I just didn't want to put it down. Um, and I I'm interested in. Um, uh why why she um with with mary and colin you know with the secret garden yes um it seems to me that it's a a book in two halves um because mary is the protagonist to begin with and then almost you know halfway through or whatever it switches to colin and then it becomes colin and maybe archibald craven's story and in my mind, when I was, um, uh, before I started really researching and, and reading your book, was I thought, oh, I wonder if she wrote half of it while she lived in Manchester and half when yeah. she got to America. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you see, I was making up my yeah. own story. Yes. Uh, but, um, yeah. yeah, but, but no. why do you think that might be? Well, I think uh, that she was extremely interested in Mary as a character, and then she got more and more interested in Colin. I mean, and the relationship between them is a fascinating one, of course. But Col it was Colin's recovery that was, which was, as you were saying, due to the environment and friendship and so on, uh, that really interested her. And I, I think she would like what you say you're doing and bringing Mary back at the, at, at the end, I think that would be perfectly, it's, that's, that's fine. Yes, because because I, yes, as I said to you, in, in our adaptation, I really wrestled with this idea of um, Colin taking over and Mary not being there. And I, um, yeah, we've brought uh, Mary yes, into the triangle fine. at the end, um, yes. so that the three of them walk back to the house yes. together. Yes. Um, but I do understand that actually, as they walk back to the house, um, it's it, it's actually Collins being able to walk, which is the yeah. extraordinary part. But that I I, I was wrestling and when it's I was part of surprise. Of course, it's not just him being able to walk, but that this is, is created as a as a dramatic moment, yeah. and, uh, and that makes a marvelous end. Yes. It does. It does. And um, and those um, those sections where Archibald Craven is sort of awakening at the same time as the children being in the um, garden. Um, so actually, maybe the main protagonist is the garden itself. Yes. Well, the garden, I hardly like to mention the film, the recent film, but of course, the real garden is entirely different from the garden in the film. And it is the the, the result of the children working together. Yeah. I mean, they are actually proper gardeners. And, yeah. and it reveals too, I mean, it emphasized how much Frances Hodgson Burnett herself was a real gardener. She wasn't just someone who, you know, although she was so rich, she ended up extremely rich, but she wasn't someone who just bossed gardeners about. She did the actual gardening. She liked weeding. I think anyone who likes weeding is a real gardener. Is a gardener. Yes. Yeah. And you can get that love of the garden really comes through, doesn't it? Um, and, and what I love, because I feel really joyful that in our country we have seasons, such distinct seasons. Yeah. Yeah. I love that it starts, you know, in that um, early, early yeah. part of the year. And yeah. as you say, it begins to grow and bloom. And yeah. with it, so yeah. does their joy, their understanding, their friendship. I, it's just 
that's the point, isn't it? Physical exercise as well. You know, there she goes out in this freezing cold weather. She's turned outside. She should go outside, but she's got a skipping rope, and that's what tr transforms her. You know, that's a large uh, uh, her exercise. Is very all these things that we talk about in the in the pandemic are, are part of the book, aren't they? They this, really are. Uh, I mean, mental mental health. Goodness, yes. Yes. Uh, well, absolutely. And in fact, we were thinking of doing The Secret Garden as a physical, you know, stage production. Yeah. And we were in early rehearsals when um, and so, the, the lockdown. The first... I'm so sorry for you, but you will do it again, of course, once it, all this is over. I, I do hope so. Restrictions. But but what happened, and I I think this is a lucky coincidence in a way, is that we had to make a pivot because we couldn't work in the same room together. We couldn't, you know, the theatres weren't open. And so we said, we still want to do it. And actually it's so relevant. You know, it opens, Absolutely. doesn't it? Yes. With, and you've, with turned, it into, and you've yeah. turned it into something quite different from what, and quite remarkable. Yes, I look forward to seeing what you're doing. Well, I, I mean, I, with a little bit of trepidation, I really, I'm really looking forward to you hearing the episodes, you know, we I broke it down into the eight episodes, um, partly or, or at first inspired by the fact that it was serialised um, for her. But then also because for me, you know, looking at the hero's journey, which is what the story is, although there are a number of heroes, um, I loved this arc, which, you know, goes in in sort of eight phases. Um, so yes, it, it's, it's really, uh, the themes for me um, really are so relevant to now. Um, and I, I know that you were saying about the more, the last time yes. we spoke. And, and that comes from the Brontes, that comes from, from Wuthering Heights, <sighs> much more than from real Yorkshire. It, and it, it, do you, did you pick that up when you read the uh, book? Do you know, I'd, I'd forgotten. Uh, oh, you mean when I... Yes, yeah, when you read um, um, Secret Garden, did you realise that the, the Wuthering Heights and, and Jane Eyre, or Jane Eyre even more, actually? Well, the... I didn't, but now you're saying it, what's fascinating for me is that Wuthering Heights is... If you were to say to me, what are your favorite stories, Wuthering Heights would be one of them. Right. One ah. I'd love to mention, because I think it would interest you, is that my editor at Macmillan, um, not the editor of my first biography, but the editor of the books that I was working on when I wanted to write a biography, she had met Frances Hodgson Burnett oh, wow. as a child. And uh, and her mother was one of a family that knew the, the, the Francis's family very well, and uh, and are those three figures in one of her books. But uh, anyway, Marnie actually told me the story of going to see Francis Hodgson Burnett, and uh, there was a cupboard in the corner of the room, and um, she said to the child to open the doors and um, see what was inside, and it was a doll's house. It was a, it arranged as a doll's house inside. And um, the, the little girl was very, very impressed and interested and looked at all the things and the little tiny, it was, you know, perfect miniatures, you know, she had everything, perfect miniatures. And then um, when the doors were closed again, Frances Hodgson Burnett said, now they're closed, everything will have come to life. And she said it in such a way that this rather sensible girl was completely convinced that the, the, the great writer was telling her that these dolls were having a life of their own when the doors were shut. And oh, I love that. I mean, that shows the power. And also the understanding, the, uh, 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 even in her extreme old age, she was more or less, well, she was on her, in her last illness when Marnie's talk, mother took her to visit. And um, she had this remarkable power of storytelling and mm. convince the child and and i saw that actual cupboard when i visited because i met um vivian um her her son's wife her 
the widow, um, who was still alive when I visited Boston in 1971 and saw the actual cupboard. Did <laughs> you? The doll's house, but it had had the divisions from the rooms. So you could see the grooves. Yes. Yeah, oh, beautiful. how lovely. Yeah. Yeah, but there are all sorts of interesting things with the family. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, it, it was wonderful to, and, the, and her granddaughter came over to the launch of the, uh, in 1974 of the book. My publishers had a big party at Penshurst because they had an exhibition. Um, um, they'd had Beatrice Potter the previous year, and then that year they had um, um, Francis Horson Burnett. And little old Fauntleroy's costume and the original manuscript came across from New York. The original manuscript of Secret Garden is in New York Public Library, and right. and we had to, uh, you know, vast insurance and so on. But uh, that and a costume uh, from the play of Little Old Fauntleroy came over. We had this big exhibition, and all the critics came down from London to Penshurst Place, Lord Delisle and Dudley's house, and Alice was dressed up as little Lord Fauntleroy and oh. handed out all the... <laughs> oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah. We've oh. got a lovely photograph of... Um, um, and Angus Wilson, um, who was a very famous novelist at that time, now a little bit forgotten, I'm afraid. But he was the only... Uh, he could, now, that's interesting, actually. I couldn't find a children's writer that Lord Delisle and Dudley had heard of. Um, and he had heard of Angus Wilson. So Angus Wilson, who liked The Secret Garden, came down and opened the exhibition, yeah. Oh, that's just what, do you know, I could talk to you all afternoon. <laughs> it's just, I think you've there's so many stories. <laughs> well, well, there are lots there's of so many stories. stories. Yeah. There well, are we so many, aren't there? We could do some sort of, um, stage uh, you know uh, some sort of festival event or something um talking about her because you yeah. obviously have got all uh, or it could be linked to your show at some point yes you never know so I'm, getting bit, I'm getting a bit old I'm... <laughs> no 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 absolutely not we, we definitely do it we'll, we'll when, do when I, we want, yes, I, I tell you what when we have our show and we open it as a physical production we'll have a, a question and answer on stage because I that know be that people will, they'll just that, really love to hear all that your, would be great. Yes. Yeah, all your well, stories. Well, I mean, there are advantages in being old. You see, one has got good memories going back to people who had met <laughs> Francis Hodgson and it is rather extraordinary. That's yeah. very extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. But it's lovely I, to talk to you. And I hope it's the first of many conversations. Good. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And good luck with the show. And I look, I mean, the no, the experience, you call it. Experience. It. Yes. Yeah. I okay. look forward to it. A box, a box will wing its way to you in the, in the post. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.